Today on Blue 58, the Packers face a familiar enemy this weekend as they travel to Tampa to take on the Buccaneers. But this game might actually be less about exercising demons than the Packers figuring out who they are as a team. Blue 58! Hello and welcome to another episode of Blue 58, the one and only podcast of ThePowerSweep.com. I'm your host, John Meerdink. Happy to be with you here for another episode. Been thinking a lot about the Packers heading into this game. And the storylines and the actual game seem to be very different. We all know, and we'll talk about it in this podcast, the Packers' struggles with the Buccaneers, particularly in the 2020 season. Two pretty, pretty noteworthy losses to the Buccaneers that year. And I think there's a temptation to make this game all about those games, a referendum on where the Packers are now relative to then and where the Buccaneers are relative to where they were then. But then again, learning about a team is kind of a funny process, isn't it? I was making my picks for this week, uh, which you can see if you are a member of our our public pick'em group or you know go a little bit more in depth with our, our Patreon support, stuff like that. And reflecting on the Packers as I made those picks, I feel like I have no idea who the Packers are right now. I think they're a really talented team. And a month from now, two months from now, say December, I think it's going to be looking pretty good, provided everybody stays healthy and all that. The end result this season is still probably going to look pretty good. I would still ex- expect the Packers to win the NFC North and be a playoff team and have a, a great win-loss record at the end of the year. But right now, I don't know who they are. That is not entirely unexpected this time of year either, because the first three, four games of the season are all about figuring out what a team it is. What can they do? What can't they do? How do they look when they're playing against somebody who's you know, other than the Packers? Uh, you know, training camp is over. We're still figuring out how they look, though, relative to the rest of the league. And right now, we're still wrestling with some pretty big issues. What is the Packers' offense right now? Will the receiving core ever gel? Can they really ride Aaron Jones and A.J. Dillon this much? Is the offensive line ever going to sort itself out? We don't know. Will the defense ever equal the sum of its parts or become more than the sum of its parts? Because right now it just looks like a lot of really individually talented guys, not so much a cohesive unit. And who in that group is going to step up? Because speaking of that talent level, the usual suspects have been pretty much the story so far. Preston Smith has been good. Rashawn Gary has been good. Kenny Clark has been good. Jair Alexander has been good. Devondre Campbell's been pretty good, though there had been a couple bumps in the road there. You see what I'm saying, though? It's mostly been about the guys you would expect to be good. But that's not just going to carry the Packers through the season. Somebody else is going to have to step up. Somebody on the edge, for instance. We talked about that in the last podcast episode. They need somebody else who can rush the passer as an outside linebacker, and right now they don't have anybody. We're still figuring out all of those things. And traveling to Tampa is probably not going to give us answers to those things. On the one hand, you might get a result like we saw in 2020. The Packers might get hammered in Tampa Bay. I don't think it's going to be that way, but it always feels like that's a possibility, especially going up against a team with a pretty good defense like the Buccaneers seem to have. If that's the case, we're not going to feel like we came out of this game learning anything about the Packers at all. But on the flip side, as we transition here into talking about the Buccaneers, We might not learn anything about the Packers for a different reason, because the Buccaneers are kind of in a weird spot, and not just because of injuries, though the injuries are considerable. Todd Bowles is their head coach this year, after Bruce Arians retired, but even that is a little bit weird, because Bruce Arians is on the sideline for the Buccaneers week in and week out, doing something, but nobody's really sure what exactly. And then the injuries. They have so many injuries and at least one suspension, that it's not really clear who can actually play this Sunday. But the Packers arrive in Tampa to face the Buccaneers, who are 2-0 after their first two games of the year. They have a 19-3 win over Dallas in Week 1. They have a 20-10 win over New Orleans in Week 2. Their defense has been the story. They have the top-scoring defense in the league through two weeks. They are fifth in yards, they are third in takeaway, and they are first in points allowed, just 13 through two weeks. And if we rewind the clock to 2020, not as it pertains to the Packers and Buccaneers in particular, I remember talking about Tom Brady's decision to go to Tampa back then, and I thought it made a lot of sense for reasons that we're seeing right now. 
Back then, the Buccaneers had an elite defense, great wide receivers, and played in a fairly weak division. In 2022, the, the Buccaneers have an elite defense, they have great wide receivers when they're healthy, and they still play in a fairly weak division. It's all sort of played out how, if you looked at it, you would have expected it to play out. The offense is in rough shape, but the defense is making it almost impossible for the Buccaneers to lose right now. Let's talk about that offense, though. The offense is Tom Brady, and Tom Brady is the offense. Not in so much that he carries it or is carrying it this season, but they've married what Tom Brady likes to do, get the ball out fast from the pocket, with what Bruce Arians liked slash likes to do, since he's still around even though he's nominally retired. He always wants to go deep. No risk it, no biscuit, right? Brady's adjusted or average depth of target this season is the second highest of his career at 10.4 yards, and it's been high ever since he arrived in Tampa Bay. Also, though, his time to throw is the fastest it's ever been at 2.26 seconds. Brady is generally throwing more than he ever has, too. It's been a little bit slower of a start this year, but his time in Tampa has represented two of his top six passing attempt seasons of his career. He throws the ball a lot. That really is their offense. That may get a little bit more difficult because the offensive line is really banged up right now. They've gone through so many injuries, season enders to a couple of starters, including their starting center, and a bunch of others on the left side, to the point that it's not really worth talking through who these guys are because they're so far down the depth chart that you don't even really know if they'd be on the team had the Buccaneers not gone through so many injuries. Suffice it to say, the left side is essentially a mix of second and third string guys. The right side, though, still fairly strong. Overall, they've graded out as one of the worst pass-blocking teams in the league, and that could be a path for, for victory for the Packers, path to victory for the Packers. The passing game. Normally, we'd I'd spend a lot of time talking about the receivers that they've got because their receiving room is formidable. However, Mike Evans is going to be suspended for this Sunday. Julio Jones is hurt and may not play on Sunday. Chris Godwin in hurt is hurt and is likely not to play on Sunday. Scotty Miller is hurt and may not play on Sunday. Things are bad enough for Tampa that they signed Cole Beasley off the street this week to their practice squad, but expect him to play this week. Signed on Monday or Tuesday, whenever it was, probably in the starting lineup on Sunday. I still wouldn't count out Tom Brady putting together some sort of functional passing attack. They still have Brashad Perryman out there. But still, uh, it, it's not going to be what it once was. And that is an opportunity for the Packers. However, there is still another opportunity for the Packers to maybe trip over themselves in this game, and that is the run game for the Buccaneers. Their run game goes through Leonard Fournette. He's carried the ball 45 times through two weeks, averaging 4.3 yards per carry. And the Packers, in short, cannot allow him to keep the Buccaneers in the game. I mentioned the right side of the offensive line still being formidable. A big reason for that is right tackle Tristan Wirfs. He's about as good as it gets on the right side of the offensive line. He was a first-team All-Pro in 2021. Big guy, six foot five, 320 pounds, and I mentioned him because he is likely going to be headed up against Rashawn Gary quite a bit. And the Buccaneers are probably going to ask quite a bit of him this week, considering the state of the left side of the offensive line. So thinking through how they're likely to try to protect Tom Brady, they're probably going to throw more resources toward the left side of their offensive line, leaving their all-pro right tackle to try and handle Rashawn Gary. That is an opportunity for Rashawn Gary to really wreck this game, because if they're not putting resources on that side of the line, if he can handle Tristan Wirfs, that sets him up for a potential big game going after Tom Brady. So how do the Packers stop this Buccaneers offense? I will preface this by saying, I'm about to say a weird thing. But I think you have to try to force Tom Brady to beat you this week. If you can slow Leonard Fournette and keep them in longer yardage situations so Brady can't just throw short and beat you that way, which he loves to do, short and intermediate routes, and then rely on the fact that their line isn't in great shape, which should allow you to get pressure, I think that's a winning recipe. And in a way, we only have to look back a week to see how that can play out. Now, the Bears weren't going to throw with Justin Fields last week for reasons that I think have become increasingly obvious. They just don't trust him to do it. Justin Fields might be pretty bad, which is a bummer, but we're talking about the Buccaneers, not the Bears. But the Bears, and we broke it down after the game, 
really had nothing they could do if they got into third and medium or third and long because Fields couldn't get the ball down the field. Now, with Tom Brady, you don't have to worry about him taking off and running like Justin Fields does or can. But the same sort of thing holds true here. If you can force Brady into medium and long situations instead of just third and short, where he has to rely on those suspect receivers and an offensive line that's in rough shape, you've got a chance there to really put a hurt on him. Flipping over to defense, Todd Bowles is the guy here. He is, you know, I, I struggle with, with what to do here sometimes when you've got a guy who's the, the head coach and the nominal defensive coordinator. I'm just treating him like he is the defensive coordinator, though there is somebody else in that position. He's the guy. It's his scheme. He's making the Buccaneers defense go. Bulls started in coaching after an eight-year NFL playing career, including a few years with Mike Holmgren in San Francisco, though they were on different sides of the ball. Holmgren had some connections to Bulls there. He started his coaching career at age 34 at Division II Morehouse College and then got, got his start in the NFL in the year 2000, a few years later, as an assistant with the New York Jets. He got his first head coaching gig in 2015 with the Jets, and it didn't go particularly well, though he did hang on through 2018. Then he moved to Tampa in 2019, had great success under Bruce Arians, of course, winning a Super Bowl in 2020, I am sorry to say. His scheme tends towards a more one-gap attacking scheme, which can work under 4-3 and 3-4 alignments. A quick word on that. Think of a traditional 3-4 defense. It's the best way to picture um, the difference between a a one-gap and a two-gap scheme. In a, in a traditional 3-4, you've got three down linemen, and their job basically is going to be to occupy the offensive line so your running back or your, your linebackers, excuse me, can operate behind their kind of front line there and make plays, either as pass rushers, as run stoppers, or as blitzers. They're two-gapping. They're not trying to penetrate through the offensive line. They're essentially holding their ground with the offensive linemen in front of them and attacking to either side as they read the defense, either to the the lineman's left or his right. That's a two-gapping scheme. On a one-gapping scheme, you're only responsible for one gap. You're trying to penetrate and get up get upfield, and that's really a big difference between the Packers' defense under uh, Joe Barry and Mike Pettin. Joe Barry likes a one-gap scheme. Mike Pettin preferred a two-gap scheme, and that's why we've seen Kenny Clark do more things like rush from the outside, rush as a defensive end instead of a nose tackle, because you want him one-gapping as opposed to two-gapping. By and large, the Packers' defense has has performed better up front in a one-gap sort of scheme because they're just getting upfield. There's less responsibility. There's less thinking for your defensive linemen. They're just getting up the field. And I think you're probably going to see this become the, the dominant defense throughout the NFL if it isn't already. That sort of approach, a 3-4 where you're trying to two-gap and just soak up a bunch of space up front, that seems kind of archaic now. And so Bulls has really been ahead of this this trend, if it is a trend, in the NFL. It's easy to see why he got to that point if you look at his history. Bulls spent some significant time working under Mike Zimmer. And if you're going to summarize Mike Zimmer's defenses in one word, I would say attacking. Zimmer was always an aggressive defensive coordinator, and he was aggressive on defense as a head coach. We talked time and time again about his double-A gap blitzes. He loved to bring guys right up the middle on either side of the center, either through real pressure or sort of simulated pressure. Bulls has always been pretty aggressive, too. Maybe not in the same way as Zimmer, but his defensive DNA is sort of built on that idea of attacking and going after the offense. The Buccaneers' pass defense is currently the top-graded coverage unit in the NFL. Safety Mike Edwards, excuse me, leads the way there. But really, they have great coverage at every level. They've got solid corners. They've got uh, Antoine Winfield Jr., who we'll talk about here in a second, uh, who does great stuff out of the slot. And then both Levante David and Devin White are solid in coverage at linebacker and are great athletes too. The run defense isn't quite as good, and there may be an opportunity for the Packers here as well. They're giving up four and a half yards per carry on the ground. That is 19th in the NFL. By run uh, run defense grade, they are 12th best in the NFL. So just on the borderline of being in that top third in the NFL. If you just look at their grades, they are most vulnerable up the middle. Even the great Vita Vea, their enormous defensive tackle, has not performed particularly well against the run this year. However, I think that is probably a little bit misleading. I think if you're just looking at grades, it will probably look like a defense is less than 
and I keep using this phrase, less than the sum of its parts, um, if you just look at individual performance grades on something like run defense. Run defense is very much a, a team thing, not an individual thing. And if you have a guy like Vito Vea who's not grading out particularly well, he can still soak up a lot of blocks and stuff and give your guys behind him a chance to work. So I would look more at personnel than grades in a situation like this. Even if the Buccaneers haven't been as good against the run as they've been in the past, it's possible that they're still performing pretty well, even if it doesn't necessarily look like it. That said, both the Saints and the Cowboys did have some success running against the Buccaneers. We actually have a question from a listener related to this. After discussing our um, more power run versus zone run uh, stuff in the last episode, Carl Anderson asks in our Discord server this week, uh, quote, related to last episode's topic, including more power and less zone runs, is that beneficial against teams like the Buccaneers who have such fast linebackers? It seems like the Packers' run game have struggled some in the past against athletic side-to-side inside linebackers, so could more power runs be a solution? Or is it just a matter of better blocking or calling different plays when the opponents has that kind of personnel on the field? End quote. Excellent question. Very important schematic stuff here. And I'm not by any means an expert on this, but I think there's something to the idea here. Because if you look at a zone blocking scheme like the Packers have traditionally run under Matt LaFleur, a weakness there is if you can string out a, a wide zone run long enough, you can essentially bog it down from from the backside. The idea is that you want to kind of get everybody moving in one direction, have the backside uh, guards and tackles and maybe a tight end on that side kind of seal things off on the back. The running back makes a cut and boom, up the field he goes away. It, it should work that way if you can get everybody sort of on train tracks moving in one direction the one cut and go sort of approach really works. But if you've got a linebacker who's, who's front and, or who's fast enough to get to the front side and prevent that sort of sort of uh, train track maneuver, getting everybody out in front by beating them to the spot and, and making them turn back already, then that cutback has to happen earlier before maybe that backside seal happens and you have more opportunities for guys to fill in on the backside maybe before the run has fully developed. We really saw that in week six in 2020 where the Packers just tried, kept trying to run wide, kept trying to run wide, and it just wasn't working. Levante David was there again and again and again, and Matt LaFleur kept trying to run it again and again and again, and it just didn't work. So I think in a man scheme where you're trying to run a little bit more power I think if you're trying to to avoid something like what the Buccaneers have done to the Packers in the past, if you're trying to erase specific guys with your blocking scheme, a more power-oriented scheme might accomplish that better than a zone scheme. Because think about it, if you're running a sweep, you're anticipating guys being in a specific spot, and you're putting a guy there specifically to take him out. For instance, if you're running basically that power sweep that we saw the Packers run against the Bears a couple times. You have your your right tackle blocking down on the end on that side, the tight end blocking down on that linebacker. You're anticipating the linebacker scraping over to sort of fill that gap. Well, how do you counter that? You've got your, your play side guard pulling around the tackle specifically to kick out that guy. He's going to kick out the first guy he sees, and the first guy there should be that linebacker. And then your center or your weak side guard is coming behind them, and he's just going to take the next guy he sees. You're not trying to block an area. You're trying to, to, to block specific guys. So if, you're, if you want to take out specific guys, if you're trying to handle specific people like Levante David and Devin White, this might be a good way to go about doing it, especially if the Buccaneers, at least by their grades, have been a little bit vulnerable up the middle. If you'd like to know about a specific guy who you should be aware of on the Buccaneers defense, I would point your attention toward Antoine Winfield Jr., uh, their excellent young safety. His dad was a Packers antagonist for a long, long time, and the younger one has been more or less the same. I point him out this week because he's a safety who plays a lot of slot corner. In fact, it would be more accurate to call him a cornerback this year than a safety. He's been on the field for about 140 defensive snaps so far this year. They've been on the field a lot on defense. And he has played 99 snaps as a slot corner so far this year and just 26 at free safety. If Alan Lazard can go, and I think he will, I think this might be an interesting matchup because though Winfield is great in coverage, what he isn't is very big. And if Alan Lazard is anything, he is very big for a receiver. He's basically a small tight end and not even all that small for a tight end. He's, he's not that much smaller than a guy like Robert Tunyon. 
if Lazard can go, and he's operating out of the slot a lot, you're going to see him going up against Antoine Winfield Jr. And I think that's an advantage for the Packers, just size-wise, both in the run game and the passing game. And you might see Alan Lazard have a big game as a result. If the Packers want to attack in this game, I think you start with the Packers running game and build out from there. I would like to see the Packers prove that they can't run before they really try to to attack that good Buccaneers secondary. Because the Bucs are going to want to bank on their secondary. So expect a lot of cover two looks early. They're going to force the Packers to, to well, to they're going to force the Packers to to do some difficult things if they want to beat the the Buccaneers coverage. So if the Packers can hammer away up front, eventually the Buccaneers are going to have to counter with numbers. They're going to have to bring somebody down or Aaron Jones and AJ Dillon are just going to pound away and pound away and pound away. I think that's the approach. Lead with the run game, make the Buccaneers prove that they can stop the run. And then as we saw last week, eventually there's going to be a, a shot play there available. And for goodness sake, just throw a couple shot plays to Christian Watson. Just because. It's something that has to be a part of the Packers offense. Go deep. Just schedule in a couple shot plays. Even if your overall approach on offense is not going to be that. Just keep the defense honest a little bit. Because Watson is so fast. I don't know if there's anybody who can really run with him. He's fractions of a second away 40-yard dash-wise from Tyreek Hill. And he's like a foot taller. I hyperbole there, obviously. But he has such rare physical gifts. Make it a part of your offense, even if it's not wor- working perfectly. Just keep firing, and a couple are going to break your way sooner or later. Quick look at the Buccaneers special teams. Ryan Sukup handles their kicking 6-for-7 on the season so far. Their punter is first-year man Jake Camarda. He's averaged 42.3 yards on nine punts so far this season. He also, it should be noted, handles the kickoffs for Tampa. Got a bigger leg than their kicker. Their kick returner, a bit of a statistical oddity here. Through two games, the Buccaneers have only returned one kick. Giovanni Bernard did it for him, and now he is on injured reserve. That's the NFL in 2022. Not a lot of kickoff returns, so I wouldn't worry about it all that much. Their punt returner is a guy named Jalen Darden. Five returns for 45 yards so far this year. Nine nine per return if you're scoring at home there. He has a long of 17. A pretty fast uh, returner, 447, 40-yard dash at his pro day at North Texas back in the day. Not super concerned, but uh, that's enough speed to keep you honest. Usually I like to spend a little time talking about the last time the Packers and whoever their opponent was played. We're not going to do that super in-depth for the Packers and Buccaneers because the last time the Packers saw the Buccaneers was the 2020 NFC Championship game, and the less said about that one, the better. We'll give you a couple notes on that one. First, the Packers should have been in the Super Bowl. I know the scoreboard says that the Buccaneers won. Really, the Packers lost more than the Buccaneers won. And that really makes it so much harder to swallow. Just inexplicable things happening in that game, inexplicable decisions, the end of half play, Tremont Williams being on the sideline for that game, David Bakhtiari's injury playing a factor in that one too. Uh, It just cascading weirdness and frustration in that one. But the Packers should have been in the Super Bowl that season. They should have, and they weren't. My experience with that game is the second note here. Um, you know, it, it's always a, the, the end of the season is always a humbling sort of time for people who do this, I, I imagine. People who podcast and, and write about the Packers and stuff like this. Because it's a reminder that it's going to end in disappointment the vast majority of the time. And so it was nice after that game or at least I thought it was, to have a nice little moment with my oldest kid, my son. He was about 15 months old, I think, when that game went down. And, um, you know, getting him ready for bed that night, it was a, it was a frustrating night. I knew I was going to have to do a, a rough podcast. And I was just sitting with him in his room. You know, we were talking, and, he, and well, it was a one-sided conversation because he didn't have much to say about the game, and he didn't have much to say in general at that age. But... Um, just sitting with him, talking with him, saying, you know, as much to myself as to him, you know, football isn't everything. 
I, I love spending time with you though. And that's more important than a game and blah, 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 all those sort of things that, that are true, but you say them to make yourself feel better in a rough situation. And after I've given this little speech, he looks up at me with his, his little toddler eyes, just big and blue and blinking. And he smiles at me and I smile back at him. And just as I go to smile, he sneezes directly into my mouth. And it is just the perfect metaphor for the end of that very exciting, promising sne- season, ending with a, a just a gross experience. And that is what I think of every time I feel compelled to think about the 2020 NFC Championship game. Felt like a sneeze in the mouth. And that's the metaphor I'm sticking with. Back to this game. How did the Packers win? What is the path to victory for the Packers? This is why I say there is a chance we could learn something about the Packers. Now, there are reasons that we might not, but I think there is a chance that we could learn something important about the Packers because I think to win this game, the Packers really have to dictate how it goes. If they do, I think they'll be the ones that win. They can't sit there and try to counterpunch with the Buccaneers. They can't sit there and try to take the Buccaneers' best shot, especially in a situation where the Buccaneers are pretty depleted right now. So how do they do that? Well, when we were talking about the Packers' defense versus the Buccaneers' offense, I said a weird thing. And I'm going to say another weird thing, at least weird for me. I think in this game, the Packers really need to establish the run. If you can keep running against this Buccaneers team, I think you can pick your spots in the passing game. And I think that is a lot more effective an approach than just trying to go up against what is the strength of this Buccaneers defense. So if you can keep moving the ball, you can decide very strategically when you want to try to pass and how you want to do that. And I think you're doing pretty good if you can make that happen. On defense, the Packers need to take things away from the Buccaneers. And the most important thing that they need to take away, because they're going to keep throwing no matter what, they need to take the run away. If they're going to throw, and they are, make them throw from suboptimal down and distance situations. Get some pressure with four pass rushers, and then maybe mix, a, mix in a blitz now and then. Although I don't, don't love the idea of blitzing Tom Brady, if you're going to turn Quay Walker loose, this might be the time to do it, though, and let him hunt up the middle because that's really where you've got to attack Tom Brady. Going around the edge is not going to work as well because he's so good at manipulating the pocket. So what's going to happen in this one? Are the Packers going to win? Are the Packers going to lose? What do we think? I am not super confident picking the Packers this week. And I think it's because of what we kind of talked about at the beginning. I am not sure who the Packers are yet. And this not uncertainty is probably not the right word. Just not knowing who they are yet makes me think that they're going to struggle to do what we've we've said they need to do to win. They're going to struggle to dictate terms, I think, to the to the Buccaneers. They're going to struggle to really inhabit an identity on offense or on defense. And I think for that reason, the Buccaneers are going to win that game. We know that the Packers are capable of doing good things. I'm just not sure on the road against a tough, well-coached team with a strong defense that it's going to work out. I think the Packers are going to lose this one. And I'm not all that bummed about it. It does drop them, in theory, to one and two. But that wasn't that that remote of a possibility to start the season anyway. And if you look at the, the really the balance of their schedule, this really is the tough part, too. They've got the Eagles out there. They've got the Bills out there yet this season. But they've got a bunch of games that they really should be heavy favorites in as well. So I'm not super hung up on the idea of the Packers losing this one. I think it's it's going to be a close game. I think the Packers just get edged out on the road against um, Tampa Bay and Tom Brady. A bunch of people are, are kind of agreeing with me in this one. 25% of voters in our poll this week say the Packers will lose. That means just 75% say the Packers will win. That's a pretty low percentage in the history of our win-loss poll. Very rarely have anybody outright predicted or has anybody outright predicted a Packers loss, though it has happened a couple times. 75% of people saying the Packers will win is pretty low. Things overall are creeping up from where they were after week one. 
Matt LaFleur and Brian Gutekunst still hanging out in an approval rating range in the in the 80s, Aaron Rodgers in the 70s. The big climber in the polls lately has been Rich Bisaccia, though. Uh, the special team coordinator has a 67.5% approval rating, pretty high for a special teams coordinator in Green Bay over the past couple of years. That's all I've got for you in this episode of Blue 58. I appreciate listening in. I appreciate it even more if you would take a second and share this episode with someone you think would enjoy it as well. It's going to help more people find the show and get more people involved in this conversation that you and I are having about the Green Bay Packers, which in turn is going to help all of us, me included, become smarter Packers fans. And as I always say, smarter Packers fans are better Packers fans, and better Packers fans are what we all want to be. I'm your host, John Meerdink. We'll see you next time on Blue 58.